Well, God bless you, and to God be the glory. Hello, Grace Church. This is your friend, Baldy Locks, as my son calls me. But you know what? I have a word for him. God doesn't put marble tops on cheap furniture. Keep shining for Jesus, I say. It is so good to be back with you. Even though we're doing everything virtually now, we're still going to serve God, share his word, and encourage the people of God. I'm honored to be a part of your ministry team as a guest speaker. And if you would, please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. There's so much here. And we're going to have a surprise ending from this particular passage of Scripture. I know you're doing a series on the kingdom. And so my part is to share with you a message about what does it mean? To be a kingdom man. In essence, to be a kingdom agent of transformation. And so I want to use a few examples in this text that will help us to see in a very practical way, what does a kingdom man look like? What does he do? What are his characteristics? What are his attributes? You see, we learn about men. We become what we behold. So if I see nothing, I may become nothing. But if I can see what it looks like, if I can see the characteristics, then I have a better chance than to replicate what I'm watching and what I'm seeing that I can become. So let's delve into this particular part of the scripture and let's really understand what does it mean to be a kingdom man. And it says here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, beginning at verse 1, David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness, which basically means mercy and grace for the sake of Jonathan? Now, this scripture makes no sense. We call this a paradoxical didactic, a yin-yang incredible statement, because why would King David want to show kindness to the family of a maniac who wanted to kill him? Remember, David is serving with Saul and he is anointed by uh, the prophet Samuel at age 12 to be the next king of Israel. But he is so in love with Saul. Saul is like a father figure to him. He's a mentor to him. He's the king. And, and so he's working. And then they go to battle. They do great work together. And they come back from battle. And the women have a song. And the song goes, Saul killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And once Saul heard that the people were adoring David and, and really uplifting David and, and, and gave him 10,000 and gave him a thousand, he became super jealous. Let me tell you something. When you are a kingdom man and when you are anointed by God and when God has called you and God is using you, Everybody won't be happy. I tell my son all the time, who's a military leader, the lion that's licking you does not love you. He's tasting you. So there are two things you must watch out for as a kingdom man. Throughout the Bible, it's true. The twin sins of envy and jealousy. You're doing good. You're serving God. You're helping out the people. You're trying to be God's man. And you find out there are people who really are not for you. They're against you. They're talking behind your back. They're stabbing you in the front. And you don't understand why. Well, Jesus said in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, he says, for I have overcome the world. I'll ask my football players all the time in the NFL, are you a diamond or a pipe? You see, pipes under pressure over time, rupture and leak, while diamonds get stronger, more radiant, more brilliant. Are you a diamond or are you a pipe? 
I will tell you in our flesh, in our own strength, all of us are pipes. We cannot do this. It's not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So if we try to do this kingdom man thing in our own strength, we all will rupture. We all will leak. We all will not be useful. But if we abide. In the presence of Almighty God on a daily basis. And we get before God and we praise and worship. And he fills us with his presence. And he fills us with his knowledge. And he fills us with his love. We become more than conquerors. So why would David want to bless a man who was envious and jealous. You see, envy means I want what you have, but I don't want to do what you did to get it. That's envy. Okay, I'm going to sit back and watch your life and watch your marriage and watch your finances grow and watch your ministry grow and watch your business grow. And I really want it. I covet it. I desire it. But I'm not willing to do the work that you did to get it. I just want it on the welfare plan. The easy, give me, give me, my name is Jimmy. That's envy. But envy, if it's not dealt with, if envy, if it's not checked, if envy is not confessed and repented from, then envy over time can turn into jealousy. And jealousy is more than envy. Envy is an attitude. Envy is a feeling. Envy is a thought. Jealousy is an action. Jealousy wants to destroy. Jealousy wants to kill. Jealousy wants to steal. Cain was jealous of Abel. What did he do? He killed him. Jealousy is saying to another, your gifting, your talent hurts me because I don't have it. And if I can't have it, you can't have it. Joseph who was his father's favorite, had a coat of many colors, and he was anointed to save his family. And when his brothers saw him coming, they said, and I quote, here comes this dreamer. Let's kill him and see what becomes of his dream. They were jealous. Saul was jealous of David. And he wanted to kill him. And he tried to kill him because he recognized this was the man that God had chosen to replace him. And he wasn't going down without a fight. He wasn't going to just lay down and quit. And he wanted to kill David. And yet David, who is now king, who is a kingdom man, doesn't want revenge. Is not bitter and angry is not trying to be macho man. Instead, he says, is there anybody left from the house of Saul, the man who tried to kill me many times, by the way, that I can show mercy and grace to, not because of, but in spite of. You see, David, when he was called to the palace, David's a country boy. David lived on the farm. David was a sheep herder. David had grass in his teeth. He knew nothing about politics or palace protocols. He was a simple country boy who was anointed by God. And so when he came to the palace, somebody saw him. Yeah, Saul wanted to kill him, but Saul had a son. His name was Jonathan. He was the crown prince. He was next in line to be king. So if anybody had a reason to be jealous and envious of David, it wasn't Saul particularly, but he was. Instead, Jonathan should have been the one because he was going to be replaced by David as the next in line to the throne. But instead of being jealous, instead of being envious, Jonathan sees the hand of God on this kingdom man. And he mentored him and he coached him and he loved him. He even protected David from his own father. When you are a kingdom man called by God to do great things, God will send two kinds of people into your life. He'll send a mentor like Jonathan, 
who will show you what to do, how to do, who will teach you what you need to learn. When I was a young boy, it was my pastor who became my Jonathan. He taught me, he saw something in me and he pulled it out of me and helped me grow into the man I am today. He was a Marine, he was a pastor, he was amazing. God will sin, but are you willing to listen? Are you willing to learn? Are you willing to be coachable and teachable? God will send a mentor. He also will allow in your life as a kingdom man, people who are called <laughs> your tormentors. So while Jonathan was a mentor to David, Saul was a tormentor. Tormentors are important. You know why? They keep you on your knees. They keep you praying. They teach you how to love your enemies. They teach you how to become a kingdom man. If the mountain was smooth, you couldn't climb it. You know, a pearl is made from pain. A little speck of sand gets inside the shell of a mollusk. And over time, there's called the mother of pearl that'll wrap itself around that piece of stone. And over a five year period, like an onion, you see the layers and that stone, that pain, that irritant, that torment becomes a pearl. God wants you to learn how to turn your pain into power and your wounds into wisdom and your scars into stars. It won't always be easy, but he wants you to depend upon him. He wants you to abide in him. That gives you the ability to deal with the tormentors who will always be in your life. They never go away. Moses had tormentors his whole time he was leading. People would say, Moses, Moses, were there no graves in Egypt? Did you brought us out to the desert to die? Stone him. And let's go back to Egypt. Paul had tormentors, people called the Judaizers, who after Paul planted a church or he was preaching, the Judaizers would come and say, he's preaching heresy. And so the Judaizers were teaching that you first had to become a Jew, get circumcised, and then become a Christian. So Paul was dealing with these tormentors, but it made him better and not bitter. It made him a winner, not a whiner. It made him a climber, not a quitter. It made him better. That's the purpose of tormentors. So don't run from them. Don't hate them. If you can learn to forgive, if you can learn to love, if you can learn to not be overwhelmed by the tormentors, then you are becoming a kingdom man. And so David here, Ask the question, is there anyone left from the house of Saul whom I can show mercy and grace? Why was David so willing to offer mercy and grace to the descendants of this maniac named Saul? You know why? He was able to offer mercy and grace because David realizes I was the recipient of mercy and grace. See, you can always tell a kingdom man, he's trying to find people he can bless. He's trying to find people he can mentor. He's trying to find people he can show the kindness of God to because he knows if it wasn't for the Lord on my side, I would have been swallowed up a long time ago. So David said, I got a debt to pay. God had mercy on me. How many of you know that if it wasn't for God, you wouldn't even be here? If it wasn't for the mercy and grace of God, you might be in jail. You might be dead. You might be divorced. You might be bankrupt. If it wasn't for God opening a door, sending somebody in your life, helping you get through. So God says, the thing you can do for me to show me that you really love me is to pass on to others. And typically, folk you don't like, folk that get on your nerves, folk that make you see, it don't take the power of God to love people who love you. That's what Jesus was saying. It doesn't take the power of God to like people who like you, who look like you, who act like you, who think like you. That's easy. But try loving people of a different race. A different mentality, a different disposition who get on your nerves, people that you would just love to hate because, but because you're a kingdom man who received the mercy 
What does mercy mean? I don't get what I deserve. What is grace? I get that which I don't deserve. And we are so grateful. We are so thankful. We are so overwhelmed that we know if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't be here. We're looking for people less fortunate than us that we can bless. Now, the second thing, so one is you're a kingdom man when you can forgive, when you can no longer hold grudges. We're looking for people to bless. Number two, the second thing that makes you a kingdom man, you are a covenant keeper. Number one, you are a forgiver. Number two, you are a covenant keeper. What do I mean by covenant? Well, when David and Jonathan were together, Jonathan giving the crown prince, the son of Saul, and when Jonathan blessed David and helped David and gave him his cloak and gave him his sword and, and became his mentor, they entered into a blood covenant. A blood covenant. Covenant means agreement. Covenant means commitment. And they became blood brothers, even though they weren't related, even though they were supposed to hate each other, even though there was animosity with the father against David. Jonathan reversed that. And he said to David, there's no doubt that you're going to be king. The hand of God is upon you. He says, remember, when you become king, all I want you to do for all that I'm giving you is remember me and my family. And they cut a blood covenant that really made the sign of the cross. They cut each other's arms. They put the blood together. And so David, when he finally becomes king, he was anointed at 12. 18 years later, he becomes the king of all Israel. And as he is in the throne, as he's now in full power, and that we call that in Greek, exousia and dunamis. He had transformational power and he had executive authority. And what are you going to do with the gifts God has given you, kingdom man? What are you going to do when you get everything you dreamed of when God gives you power and God gives you position and God gives you authority are you going to worship yourself are you going to just be selfish and me us for no more or are you going to remember the covenant that you have with your king the spirit of the Lord is upon me Jesus said to preach the gospel to the poor to restore sight to the blind, to heal the brokenhearted, and to set free those that are in captivity and declare that the mercy and the grace of God is available to all who need it and want it. Are you a kingdom man? Are you fulfilling those objectives in your life? Who are you restoring sight to? Who are you helping overcome a broken heart? Who are you able to help and coach and develop? That is what God is looking for. You know what the dead sees called the Dead Sea because it takes in water, but it never gives out. And so it's stagnant. God expects you to say, I get so I can give. David is now king. Let's go on down and let's look. And so David in the story, he's asking anybody less from the house of Saul. Saul's been destroyed. Saul's died. His lineage is gone. And there's a guy named Ziba in the story who's a servant of Saul. And David says, hey, I got a debt to pay. I got to bless somebody. From the house of Saul. Is there anybody around? And Ziba says, yeah, there's a guy left from the house of Saul. His name is Mephibosheth. And he's living in a place called Lodabar in the house of Mahira. Lodabar means the place of no pasture, no future, no promise, no gifting. There are people around you. You know, we love to go on mission trips and nothing wrong with that. God calls us to do that, to go to India and go to Africa and go to China. I've done that, planted churches and leadership centers. But you know what? Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. That's your home in Judea. That is your province, your state, you know, where you live in Samaria 
These are people who are not of your same race, who you are supposed to dislike based upon your ethnocentric ideological differences. And so the Jews called the Samaritans dogs. They did not like them. They didn't want to be a part. Why? They were of the 10 tribes of Israel. They got invaded by the Assyrians. They became part of that pagan culture, intermarried, had babies, forgot about God, and became this other group of people called the Samaritans. And so the Jews would walk around Samaria to get to another destination because they so despised this other race of people. And yet Jesus spoke to a woman in Samaria at the well and was able to save her and all of her family. That is a kingdom man. You see, I'm in error theologically. When I say I am a black Christian, I am in error if I say I am an American Christian because I'm putting my Christianity in a deficit position and I'm putting my ethnocentric culture, class or race in the agitable position. So what it means is that if I say I'm a black Christian, it means that I must shape my Christianity to fit into my black culture. If I say I'm a white Christian, I must then take my Christianity and make it look like my whiteness. If I say I'm an American Christian, it means I must take my Christianity and make it fit under the American ideology. So it never should be anything before Christian. Christian American, Christian soldier, Christian whatever it is, then your blackness, your whiteness, your American then must fit under your Christianity first. That is being a kingdom man. So David, being a kingdom man, says, is there anybody left? And, and Ziba says, yes, there's a guy named Mephibosheth, which means a bearer of shame. And David says, here's a key now. David says, here's a key now. Go fetch him. You know, we are all here today as believers because somebody fetched us. Somebody witnessed to us. Somebody invited us to church. Somebody came to our house for a Bible study. Somebody picked us up when we were down. Fetching means to go get somebody who can't get there by themselves. Pick them up and carry them. Do you know every time God did something great for the world, he fetched one man. When God wanted to save the world from the flood, he fetched Noah and said, build me an ark. When God wanted to start the Hebrew race in which Jesus will become a degenerate of, God went out and he fetched Abraham and said, Abraham, leave your mother and father and go to a land you know not of. When God wanted to save the family from starvation, he fetched Joseph through a dream and said, you're going to be the savior of your family and be a type of Christ. When God wanted to lead the Hebrew people out of bondage, he fetched Moses through a burning bush and said, the place you stand is holy ground. Take off your shoes and go to Pharaoh and say, Moses, 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 say to Pharaoh, let my people go. When God wanted to share the gospel to the Gentiles, the unclean, the pagan, he fetched a man named Saul on the Damascus road and said, Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? And made him the greatest evangelist and preacher of the gospel throughout Asia Minor. And out here, he fetched him when God wanted to save mankind from sin and hell, he fetched himself and went as one man, Jesus Christ. Who are you fetching? God has done it. When Jesus was starting his ministry, he went out and fetched disciples. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him first deny himself, pick up his cross, which is ministry, pick up your ministry in your community and follow me. We are, we are very good at going to third world countries 
But do you understand, kingdom men, we have third world countries right here in Cleveland, in Detroit, in Milwaukee, in D.C. We need to do more work right here in Jerusalem, right here in Judea, right here in Samaria, before we go to the uttermost parts of the world. You see, Jesus gave a priority. Jerusalem, right where you are. Judea, people that are like you in your community. Samaria, folk who are of a different race, different backgrounds, going into the hood, help to build ministries to minister. You know why? You know, I'm half white, half black, but I identify as being black. Can I tell you something that breaks my heart? Kingdom men, I need your help. Do you know that 72% of all black children in America are born out of wedlock and grew up in a single parent home in these United States? Listen to that number. Two thirds of all black babies are born out of wedlock and are raised in a fatherless home. Do you know that 80% of our social ills, high school dropout, teen pregnancy, abortion, drug addiction, violent behavior, early incarceration, is a direct result of growing up in a home without a father? If we can work together to mentor and coach and be kingdom men in our communities, in our inner cities, because what I learned working for a president doing a work on fatherlessness is if a man, a coach, a mentor, will spend one hour a week for 52 weeks being a Jonathan, mentoring a David, the head, hearts, hands, habits, and humanity of that fatherless child is changed forever. David was changed forever, and he became a mentor and fetched Mephibosheth and brought him to his home and told him everything that you have lost, everything that was taken from you, I'm going to help restore it. You see, that's what Jesus did for us. He restored us back into relationship with God. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know what God is in the business of, kingdom men? He's in the business of restoration, restoring your marriage, restoring your finances, restoring your health, Restoring your dignity, restoring your manhood. So if you want to be a kingdom man, you got to forgive. You have to be a mentor who goes out and fetches. You can't sit back and wait for folk to come to you. God didn't wait for Moses to come to him. Abraham didn't come to God. God went to them. Jesus went out and found his disciples. Here's a challenge for you to be a kingdom man. Number three, who are your 12 disciples? God just didn't save you to sit around and be, you know, you. He saved you to be a magnet, to pull others in to the kingdom. And you should have one man every month that you invite to church. 
So one month is Charles. You spend four weeks inviting, bringing Charles, you know. Then the next month, you go after Gregory. And you go and spend, you know, time in the next month. So every month, you should be spending time mentoring, coaching, fetching, restoring one man. Until after a year, you have 12 men that you have disciple. That's a kingdom man. That's what Jesus did. And that's what he expects us to do. As I close this message on what it means to be a kingdom man, let me give you the five pillars from my new book called The Power of One Man, Being a Kingdom Man. Number one, you got to be present. Half the battle is showing up. You can't be a kingdom man staying at home. You got to go to church. You got to go to Bible study. You got to be involved in people's lives, your children's lives. You got to go to the inner city. You got to be present. Half the battle is showing up. Secondly, you got to be attentive, meaning that you just can't show up and say nothing. You got to ask questions and get involved and care enough and be able to get into their world. Thirdly, you have to be affirming. Oh man, so many men put other men down and, and down them and down them. Speak life. Speak life. That's a kingdom man who speaks life into people's lives. I see you being great. I see you being successful. I see you being amazing. As a man thinks in his heart, so he becomes life and death and is in the power of the tongue. Fourthly, you got to be consistent. That's a big thing in the kingdom. You can't start and stop, start and stop, start and stop. You got to be consistent. Matter of fact, if you start mentoring someone in the inner city or on the farm or somewhere and you start and stop, start and stop, they quit and they become worse off than what they were. Be consistent. And lastly, be committed to Jesus Christ. What does that mean? As I close, this is the key to everything, to be a kingdom man. I cannot give you what I don't have. So Jesus says in John 15, I am the true vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and me in you, you shall bear much fruit. What does that mean, abiding? That means before you try to do anything, you gotta be something. That means you gotta be present with God every morning. I don't care if it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, Every man who wants to be a kingdom man has to abide, be still in praise and worship before you turn on CNN, before you turn on Fox News, before you look at your cell phone. You give your first eye opening and your mind and heart to God. You praise and worship. My God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven. You got to get into worship and praise. Here's why. We talk about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-discipline. Those are just words to memorize. It makes you a kingdom man. When I abide in Christ each morning and give my first fruits to God, I then am a recipient of God's presence and his presence deposits into me love, joy, and peace. The first three parts of the fruit of the spirit. I receive God's love. He loves me unconditionally. I understand the joy of the Lord is my strength and he gives me a peace that no man can give and no man can take away. You are becoming a, a, a kingdom man. When you spend time with God, then when God deposits into you love, joy, and peace, the second three, you can give now to others patience, kindness, and goodness. Because you're so filled with the presence of God every single day. You praise, you worship before you do anything else. You are transformed, your mind. That's what is, the, Paul says what? Do be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. That's what happens when you spend time with God every morning. You're able to give patience, kindness, and goodness. So you get love, joy, and peace to give patience, kindness, and goodness to become humble, faithful, and self-disciplined. You become a kingdom man by staying in the presence of God and making that your priority. We can't become kingdom men in our own strength. But if we stay on our faces every morning, I mean it, men, every morning, and here's my meditation that I say as I close. 
Lord, forgive me. I know that I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Number two, Lord, help me. I can't be a good father without you. I can't be a good husband without you. When I try to do good, evil's right there with me. Help me. Third, Lord, bless me with wisdom and knowledge and resources to bless others. Would you bless me, O oh God, with your favor? Fourth, God, use me on my job. Use me in my home. Use me in the inner cities of this nation. You said, as I do unto the least of these, I do unto you. And Lord, when I'm done and I'm tired, restore me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water and he restores my soul. That is my daily meditation every morning. I need God. I need his anointing and favor and presence. I need him. You know why? Because everything about us men Without God, we stink. As soon as you wake up in the morning, your breath stinks, your underarms stink, everything that comes out of you stinks. So we gotta what? Every day, every day, we gotta shower it, scrub it, deodorize it, perfume it, cologne it, wipe it, or we're going to offend people. You know what? The same thing is true about our spirits. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, when you recognize, I stink. I need a daily shower by the Holy Spirit. You are a kingdom man. Let God use you. Let God use you to be a blessing like David was to Mephibosheth. This is Dr. Ron Archer saying, I love you, kingdom man. God bless you.